Greetings, brothers and sisters at home. Uh, we come this day, whenever you're watching this or listening to this, to uh, open the scripture together. We want to hear God speak to us. We return to the book of James uh, today, and we are going to be looking at chapter 4. Uh, would you join me in praying as we open the word together? Father, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the ways that it has buoyed me and comforted me and strengthened me uh, through the midst of this isolation from other people. Thank you for the ways that it is working in your people all over the world. Uh, we're grateful to you that you would come to be with us, that you would walk with us through this trial, and we would ask for you to bring it to an end. We pray for our government. We pray for the leadership in our state community and in our country, uh, that they would have great wisdom as they contemplate uh, moving out of this isolation and moving out of this social distancing season that we've been in. Help them to know the right timing. Help us as God's people to uh, honor them appropriately and submit to them appropriately in these difficult days. Would you grant us grace Father, we need it so desperately. We are needy people. We don't deserve your care for us. We don't deserve your power at work for good in our lives, but you offer it to us anyway. So we come to you as needy people. We come to you as sheep, and we want to depend on you. We want to rest in you for the grace that you offer and the grace that you provide. Would you help us as we navigate this difficult passage, this challenging passage that is going to push us and press us and perhaps even cut us in ways that only the good surgeon can. We ask for you to do your surgery upon our hearts. Carve away the places that are sinful and hard and calloused. Clean us up, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we were last looking at the book of James, we considered the final paragraph of chapter 3. Pastor Ken helped us see the selfless nature of the wisdom that comes from above, the wisdom that comes from God, the wisdom that you and I need to endure trials and to live well in this world. But James had contrasted that wisdom with another kind of wisdom, a wisdom that really isn't wisdom at all. In James 3.15, he spoke of this alternative wisdom as earthly, unspiritual, demonic that's an interesting trio of descriptions, isn't it? In verse 14, he had described what this so-called wisdom looks like. It's characterized by bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in people's hearts. As James passes on, presses on in his letter to these scattered Christians, these followers of Jesus suffering various kinds of trials, he picks up this non-wisdom and describes it further. In James chapter 4, we're going to see this earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom on display, and it's ugly. It's this kind of non-wisdom that results in chaos, confusion, and conflict, and not only out in the world, but also it shows up in the church. Just as James can speak of a demonic faith back in chapter 2, a faith that lacks good works so here he speaks of demonic wisdom that is characterized by selfish ambition and bitter jealousy that then results in disorder, vile practices, and conflict between people. But before we look at James's next uh, discussion, let's take a quick look at something Jesus said that helps us make sure we're really clear on the nature of this wisdom, the nature of this way of thinking and living. Toward the end of his ministry, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that he was going to be betrayed, crucified, and raised from the dead. It seems that no matter how clearly or how repeatedly he told them this, they just about didn't even hear him speak about resurrection. That piece of Jesus' words went in one ear and out the other. They heard the betrayed and crucified bits loud and clear, and they would not accept it, or at least Peter wouldn't. On one of these occasions, when Jesus told the disciples what was about to happen, 
Peter pulled Jesus away from the other disciples and rebuked him. It started to tell him that no such thing could ever happen to him. Pick up the story in Mark 8, 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Notice how harshly Jesus chastises Peter. First, he calls him Satan. Now, Jesus is certainly not suggesting that Satan has possessed Peter or is controlling Peter's thinking or anything like that. One time in college, I was caught up in some kind of argument with one of my peers, and my best friend was there and listening. At some point in the conversation, my best friend entered the conversation and sided with the person that I was arguing against. After the discussion was over, my friend and I were walking off somewhere together, and I stopped him, and I said, Et tu, Brute? I was quoting the Latin from Shakespeare's theatrical portrayal of Julius Caesar. The Latin means, even you, Brutus? It's a line from Julius Caesar addressed to Brutus as Brutus was betraying and murdering him. I was using it as a way of dramatically calling out my friend's betrayal of me. His name wasn't Brutus, and we don't regularly speak Latin. Jesus is doing the same kind of thing here. He's dramatically portraying Peter as on the side of Satan in his attempt to prevent Jesus from going to the cross and his refusal to believe that the cross is exactly where Jesus must go. But then Jesus explains Peter's thinking for us. Peter's thinking is merely human. So what we see here is that mere human logic and mere human thought processes actually put people on the side of Satan and not Jesus. James says the same thing here. He says the wisdom, the so-called wisdom, the non-wisdom that is characterized by selfish ambition and jealousy results in disorder and every vile practice is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. It's earthly, merely human, unspiritual, devoid of the influence of the Holy Spirit, and ultimately demonic. This kind of wisdom puts one on the side of the devil himself. Or, Rather, to use the even harsher language of the Apostle John, it reveals that one is a child of the devil. The manifestation of this kind of wisdom is our words. When we use our words to make war, to fuel conflict in the church especially, we may be showing our true allegiance. This is what James warns us about at the beginning of chapter 4. Let's see how he sketches this out. We begin by looking at how desire produces conflict. and Conflict reveals allegiance. Let's look at James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So James begins here in this section by highlighting conflict's source, unsatisfied, selfish desires for personal pleasure. Verses 1 and the first part of verse 2. So he says, he raises the question, what causes these quarrels? What causes these fights among you? And then he points to their passions, 
that are at war inside each one of them. They're internal desires for passion or pleasure. We'll talk more about the meaning of that word in just a minute. And then he puts it in terms of desire specifically. You desire and do not have. You, you desire, you want something, you want things, and you can't get them. You covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You, you are causing fights, causing arguments, causing dissension and division in the church because you're not getting what you want for yourself. And so... James takes us back even by raising the topic of desire again to chapter 1, what James had said in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. There, James was talking about the process internally. Here, James is talking about the process that moves from internal to external. Desire, especially when left unsatisfied, breeds contempt and conflict with other people. Now, that, that raises a question for me. Why would we do this? Why would we fight? Why are fights caused by our desires? James doesn't explain all of that, but I thought of at least four reasons that we might fight in the situation when we want something for ourselves, some pleasure to experience for ourselves, and we don't get it. Why would that then move us to fight with other people? I can think of four reasons why. Number one, you might fight to take by force what you want from someone who has it. You see what you want in somebody else's hands, and so you say, well, I want it bad enough. I'm going to go either pick a fist fight with that person or get into an argument or a quarrel and try to use my words to force them to give me what they have that I want. So we might fight because we want to take from someone else what we want. Secondly, we might fight to overcome someone preventing us from getting what we want. So we see that what we want is being uh, prevented by another person. And so they're standing in the way. They're standing in between us and what we want. And so in order to get past them, we start a fight with them. We try to push them out of the way somehow so we can get what we want. Thirdly, we might fight to ensure that other people don't get what you want. You ever felt that before? You want something so badly you can't get it, and you see somebody else trying to get it too, and you realize, you know, I don't. if I can't have it, nobody can. I don't want them to have it either. And so you start fighting with them to pull them away from getting what you want and what you can't get for yourself. A fourth way that we, a fourth reason that we might fight in this situation is out of envy for other people seeming to get what they want. James is going to talk about envy a couple of times in this passage. And so that might actually be where his mind is focused in all of this, but we might see that other people seem to be getting what they want, and our jealousy, our envy rises up within us, and just out of spite and out of envy, we pick a fight with them because we're not happy that they are, they seem to be getting what they want. And so fights and quarrels in the church are often caused by individuals not getting what they want for themselves. But then James raises the question, why aren't you getting what you want? And he gives a couple of different reasons at the end of verse 2 and end of verse 3. You have not, you do not have, because you do not ask. So he may be envisioning two groups of people at the end of verse 2 and end of verse 3. At the end of verse 2, he speaks of people who are engaging in what you might call a sinful silence. Some of you, some of the people in James's audience are not asking God for what they want. You're not asking God for what you want. You have these desires. You're trying to get what you want for yourself by yourself instead of asking the one who has all the resources in the universe. You're not even asking for what you want. And it may be that the reason they're not asking for what they want is because they know that their desires are for selfish pleasure and they have a sense that God wouldn't want to give them that anyway. But the problem is they have a bad view of God. They don't view God as the generous giver that James described him as in chapter 1. And so they're refusing to even pray, to even ask about what God could do for them or could provide for them in the midst of their desires. 
But then in verse 3, he says, you ask. So some of the people may be praying, may be asking for God to fulfill their desires. And so James then speaks of a sinful kind of speaking. And that's been a major topic throughout James's letter. It's a major focus of James, how we use our words, and that includes how we pray to God. And so there's a sinful silence, but there's also a sinful speaking. Some of you are asking God wickedly. That word, the ESV translates wrongly as a word, very strong word for evil or wickedness. You are asking wickedly out of a selfish desire to spend what God gives you only for your own personal pleasure. Now, that word spend tells us, kind of hints uh, further, that these people are wanting material resources, material things to enhance their own personal pleasure. Now, that word in the ESV that's translated passions in verse 1 and in verse uh, 3 is the Greek word that we get our English word hedonism from. It's always used negatively in the New Testament. It appears in Luke 8, 14, in Jesus' parable of the sower and the soils, where the thorns in the parable represent pleasures, this word, that choke those who hear the word so that their fruit does not mature. In Titus 3, 3, Paul speaks of the pleasures which formerly enslaved us before God saved us. And in 2 Peter 2.13, Peter refers to the pleasure of unrighteous people reveling in their deceptions in broad daylight, even as they gather with followers of Jesus. James is surely speaking similarly. Churchgoers, churchgoers who allow their desires for personal pleasure to drive them into conflict with others in the church or to pray so selfishly, reveal their adultery against God, their rejection of God, and their affair with the world. Now, before we move on into James' indictment, his condemnation of these people who act this way and who think this way uh, as adulteresses, I need to just make sure we understand desires and pleasures are not necessarily bad in and of themselves. Uh, the scriptures speak positively of our desires, and they speak positively of pleasure. Let me give you two examples from the Psalms. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in Yahweh, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, what's going on there is the, the psalmist David is commanding people, instructing people to delight yourselves in the Lord, delight yourselves in Yahweh, and the promise is Yahweh will give you the desires of your heart. Now, what's assumed there is that if you are delighting yourself in the Lord, you are having such a positive, joyful, enjoyable relationship with God that your relationship with God is shaping your desires so that you want, you desire the things that God desires. And so he happily gives them to you. Fitting in with New Testament theology about prayer, God gives and answers our prayer according to his will. And so when our Life is shaped by our delight in God, by our rejoicing in God, by our enjoying a happy and positive relationship with God. That experience, that relationship shapes our desires. And so when we ask God for what we really want, he gives it to us because what we really want is shaped by what he wants for us. A second text from the Psalms, Psalm 1611. Very well-known verse, probably. David writes, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So David is saying that God provides full joy, complete joy, perfect joy. And in God's presence is where you can experience eternal everlasting fullness of pleasure also. 
And so we often look at that verse and sometimes we'll think, well, that's talking about heaven. That's talking about after I'm dead from this world and I go, my spirit goes to be with Jesus or a little bit better, uh, more biblically, uh, thinking about the new cre- my experience in the new creation when I'm bodily present with the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. And there is a truth to that. But what we have to remember is that as Christians, followers of Jesus, right now we are always in the presence of the Lord. The Holy Spirit of God lives in us every single moment of every single day. And so that means we are in the presence of God right now. And so what that means for us from that text, Psalm 1611, is that the fullness of joy and pleasure, true pleasure, pure pleasure, good pleasure is available to us all the time, no matter what our life is doing, no matter what our circumstances look like, fullness of joy is available to followers of Jesus now, not just as a promise for later, but now in our day by day walk with the Lord. And so desire and pleasure can be very good things. Let's move back into James and move on with him into verse four. James gives us conflicts, condemnation here. He calls it spiritual adultery in verse 4. He calls them adulteresses, you adulterous people. And so he's, he's using the imagery of the Old Testament where relationship with God, the covenant relationship between Israel as a nation and God was depicted as a marriage union. And so as they worshipped other idols, other gods, they abandoned their vows. Think about a marriage. You make vows, promises to your spouse. You enter into a covenant relationship in that moment. And you are obligated to uphold your vows throughout your life. The relationship with God that we have as Christians is also akin to a marriage. But don't miss that this is a metaphor. This is an image that's talking about our relationship with God. And so what he's depicting here is that people who act like this, people who allow their desires to drive them into conflict within the church are people who are guilty of a broken marriage covenant. And what he's depicting here is is not uh, the idea of divorce or the idea of um a real marriage union that's been split. He's picturing the idea, the possibility, if you can imagine it, of a couple going to the altar, a man and a woman going to the altar and making these vows, and one of them makes these promises to the other and and doesn't mean them at all, has no intention of keeping the promises. They mouth the words, they say the promises, but then As soon as the relationship is sealed, they begin to reveal the truth that they had no commitment, no real relationship with that uh, other person. And so this broken marriage covenant, this adulterous idea James is depicting here, I think goes back to chapter two. This is describing people who claim to have faith in Jesus, but have no works. Or rather, they claim to have faith in Jesus, but their works, their desires being unsatisfied and then acted on in conflict and warfare with other other believers, other people in the church, shows them to be false, phony, un- unbelievers. And so they're, they're, they're called adulteresses because they mouthed the words of a commitment to God, but it was not real. It was not genuine. And in fact, what they're actions here reveal about them is their allegiance, their allegiance to the world. Friendship with the world, James says, uh, is the same thing as enmity, hostility with God. And he says that you cannot be friends with the world and engaged in a marriage relationship with God. You got to think about friendship in terms a little bit different than we do in our modern setting. Now, many of us have really close friends, and so we understand the concept of a close and deep and healthy and strong friendship relationship. But in the ancient world, that's the only thing that they would refer to as a friendship. There would be no sense of calling someone a friend who is just a Facebook friend in the ancient world, that is some kind of acquaintance. A friend, if you're going to use the word friend in the ancient world, it meant a lifelong commitment of 
I want to do you good. I want to benefit your life. And I expect benefit from you. It is a reciprocal kind of relationship there. So the, the friendship idea is bound up with the idea of allegiance and commitment and devotion in the ancient world. And so when he says this, he's saying you cannot be one and the other at the same time. You cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God like Abraham was. Abraham was called a friend of God. James mentioned that back in chapter 2. You want to be like that. You want to be a friend with God. You want to be in a healthy, committed, permanent, even a marriage relationship with God. And you cannot do that if you are committed to and your allegiance is really to the world, its way of thinking and living, and its system of pleasures. You cannot have it both ways. So if you are acting like this, you're revealing your allegiance to the world. And if your allegiance is to the world, then you are God's enemies. You are God's enemy. That is not a good place to be for anybody. You are God's enemy if this is the way that you live. You're revealing your identity as a false disciple, possibly. James goes on in verses 5 and 6 to give a scriptural grounding for what he's been teaching here. Now, verse 5, everybody seems to admit that this is the most difficult verse in the book. Okay, So we're treading on tough, tough, uh, we're treading through tough waters here in verse 5. One writer summarized 20 different possible translations and interpretations of this verse. So everything I say from here about verse 5 is somewhat tentative, okay? Uh, it can be taken in multiple ways. And you heard me read the English Standard Version earlier, and if you're reading a different Bible translation in your home, you probably see some significant differences. All of the major Bible translations, most of them are significantly different. And that, that should tell you something just in and of itself. When you see major differences between English tra Bible translations, the thing that you need to recognize is that, oh, the original language of this verse must be really tough. That's the conclusion you should draw when you see something like this. I'm going to give you my best effort and give you where I stand rather than going through all 20 possibilities or anything like that. Uh, I think the 1984 edition of the NIV has what I think is probably closest to what James intended. And that's what we're always concerned about when we see these things. What did the original author intend to communicate? And that's what we're after. So here's the 1984 NIV if you don't have that in front of you. It says, or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? So if we take it this way, James is not quoting any particular Old Testament verse in verse 5. Rather, he's simply referring to the consistent teaching of the Old Testament that human nature has a tendency toward envy, and that's a bad thing. One example which fits James' thinking in this section of his letter is Ecclesiastes 4.4, which says, then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. The author of Ecclesiastes is characterizing what James calls earthly wisdom. Ecclesiastes describes a way of living life that is under the sun only, without the perspective of the one who is above the sun. Part of that limited perspective drives people to envy. Or James may have in mind Proverbs 3.31, which is just a few verses before Proverbs 3.34, which James quotes in the next sentence in James chapter 4. And Proverbs 3.31 says, Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. Jane, either way, James is simply saying here that Scripture clearly and consistently condemns the kind of bitter jealousy that characterizes demonic wisdom the so-called wisdom that is actually resulting in the chaos of conflict in the churches. But then that raises the question, if that is the bent of human nature, what hope does anyone have? That's where the contrast of verse 6 comes into play, further rooted in Proverbs 3.34. In verse 6, James offers grace for the humble, grace for the humble. So, 
He's just condemned envy in the human nature. He says human nature is bent toward intense envy ever since Genesis chapter 3. We could list a host of examples from the scriptures themselves where envy played a role in massive, massive chaos that unfolded in the life of people uh, in history. But we don't need to go there. Here, the question then is, well, how do we remedy that situation? How can we ever get past that? And the answer is God's grace. He says at the beginning of verse 6, but he, but God gives more grace. Or more literally, God gives greater grace. Greater grace. Greater than what? Greater than the common grace given to all in the gift of the human spirit at creation. So if the human spirit is so broken by the fall, and it is, that it tends toward this kind of envy that drives us to fight with other people and to be hostile toward God and other people, what could ever fix that? And the answer is God provides grace that is greater, grace that is stronger, grace that is powerful to change a person's nature, a, a person's bent, a person's spirits. So God's grace is required. You remember the definition that I've given of God's grace? Grace refers to God's power acting for the benefit, for the good of those who deserve only that. Grace is God's power at work for good in the lives of people who only deserve bad. Every time you see the word grace, I want you to be thinking in that realm. Every time you see the word grace in your Bible, you need to be remembering this means that the objects of God's grace, the recipients of God's grace, like me, do not deserve this. We deserve punishment. We deserve God's wrath. But he offers grace instead. He offers grace that actually is effective in our lives. He offers grace that is not just a, a posture. It's not just saying that he, he looks at us favorably, but it's that he moves into our lives and he actually does something that changes our circumstances, changes our experience, changes our very nature for good. That's what grace is, and that's what grace does. And so the promise of grace here is the remedy that's offered for this problem of a human nature that is so bent toward evil and envy that we could never pursue anything otherwise. He quotes Proverbs 3.34 to ground that explicitly. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. And so he, he here connects pride with this envy. Uh, it's obvious, I think, when we look at the conflicts that we experience, that very often there's pride involved. When we won't lay down our arms, we won't lay down our perceived rights to fight with somebody else because we think we're right or we have a right or we have a pleasure, a desire for pleasure that's not being fulfilled and we think we ought to get it, we think we deserve it, we think we have a right to it. That kind of attitude God hates. And not only does he hate it, he opposes it. This word is so strong. It's a word that means he, he clothes himself for battle against you. He puts on his armor to come and fight against you. It's not a position you want to be in. God putting on his battle armor. You want him to go to war against your enemies, not against you. But the proud person, this is not the attitude of pride that God goes against. God opposes the proud person. God opposes proud people. It's not just pride that God hates. He opposes, he fights against, he wars against proud people. But the alternative, he gives grace to the humble. So even as James offers this remedy to, to repair what's broken in human nature, grace, he says there is a condition. There is a requirement. There is a, a posture or a position that you must get yourself in in order to receive the grace that's needed to overcome this attitude and this problem. Now, we could step back and we could say, okay, so when we think about the larger picture, there is a mystery here about God's sovereignty in relationship to our responsibility. 
James is focusing here on our responsibility, but both are present here. God gives grace to the humble. Well, how does one experience humility? Is it not also a gift of God's grace? Is it not also something that God works in us by his spirit? Humility required to receive more grace is also a gift of God's grace. But James is focusing on our responsibility. We do have to humble ourselves. We do have to act. And the wonder of it all, and this is mysterious. We should wonder at it and not seek to try to explain it mechanically or scientifically, but wonder at the reality that if we actually do experience humility, if we actually do successfully humble ourselves before the Lord, it's because God has provided the ability to do that. God has been at work to equip us and to humble us. Very often he does that through our circumstances. He pushes us down. He reveals to us how weak and frail we really are so that we will respond by bowing the knee, and putting our face on the ground before him and his majesty. And so there's a mystery here that we don't need to untangle. We simply need to worship God and express our gratitude that this is the way he works. It is all great. We are dependent on grace for everything that we have. Well, as we turn to verses 7 through 10, we turn to the Ten Commandments of Repentance. And I call it that, and I refer to it that way, because in verses 7 through 10, there are ten commands that have to do with repentance. James is piling on these commands. Again, he's focusing on our responsibility, and he's characterizing repentance in certain ways. Now, I believe that he's targeting the people that he has just labeled as adulteresses. Targeting the people who are responsible for causing the conflicts uh, that are going on in the church. And he is suggesting, I believe, that they need to turn to Jesus for the first time. They need to turn away from their sin for the first time. So I believe verses 7 to 10 are especially directed to these false believers, these people who've made professions of faith, who've claimed to follow Jesus, but their life has revealed that they do not know Jesus at all. And so rather than simply kicking them out of the church, rather than simply saying, you don't belong here, he says, you've got to repent. Here is your opportunity to experience the grace of God. You've got to repent and turn away from your sin. Those caught up in these self-centered, envy-driven, arrogant conflicts must submit, approach God properly, and repent. They are the adulteresses. He's going to call them sinners. He's going to call them double-minded or two-souled, arrogant people claiming to have faith, but whose works are showing them to have only, at best, demonic faith, demonic wisdom. People who are still under the power of Satan. So let's look at verses 7 through 10. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So he calls on them first and foremost to submit themselves to God. Submit yourselves to God and resist the devil. Now, I believe, again, he's referring, he's addressing specifically these people who are false believers. Now, everything in these verses could also be extended to true believers because we need to repent too. We can get caught up in these attitudes where our selfishness bleeds out and we need to repent as well. And so this call to repentance can apply to us who are genuine followers of Jesus just as much as it applies to those who are self-deceived and think they know Jesus but really don't. But I believe that too James is targeting directly here. So when he says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, he's talking about a fundamental shift of allegiance. You see, the moment before you begin to trust in Jesus truly, before you really receive Jesus into your life, you are under the authority, the power, the ownership of Satan. That 
was true of every one of us before we, be, we came, became believers in Jesus. And that if you are in that situation today, you need to know this about yourself. You are not free. You are enslaved to this ruler called Satan. You are one of his subjects. So when James says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, he's saying, fundamentally, you've got to start serving a new master, a new Lord. Your Lord was Satan, and you've got to resist his lordship. You've got to resist his control. You've got to turn away from that and reject his power, reject his rule over your life, and submit to the rule of a new Lord, a new master, and his name is Jesus. And so faith in Jesus is bound up in this call to submit to God, to submit to God. It means trusting him to know what's best for your life, trusting him to direct your affairs and your life and to resist the devil. And the promise is he will flee from you. So for someone who doesn't know Jesus, until that very moment that you cross the line to, into believing in Jesus for the first time, you are enslaved to Satan. What makes the difference? God sets you free by his grace. He breaks the chains that Satan has over your life. And so at that moment, you are suddenly free. And when you're set free, guess what? When you begin that moment of trusting Jesus and resisting the devil, he runs away from you. He runs away from you. He can't handle you anymore. He can't control you anymore. And so he leaves. Now, he comes back, right? When you're a follower of Jesus, the devil's power, the devil's influence is still out there around you. And it still comes into your life occasionally. And so the call to resist the devil is an ongoing call. The call to resist the devil is repeated in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. And that is definitely written to those who are following Jesus. And so the threat of the devil is truly erased for those who follow Jesus. But the call is to resist his influence, to resist his power, to resist his ways in this world. And there's a particular moment that that begins for a person who's been under his power their whole life. So James promises also here that as people turn their allegiance over to God, submit, and reject the devil's influence and genuinely repent in humility, God's grace will come to them, and on Judgment Day, they will be exalted by God, which will include all the pleasure they ever could have properly desired in this life. So he says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. In verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. There's an, a reciprocal intimacy that takes place. When you leave are transferred out of the kingdom of Satan and into the kingdom of God's beloved son. There is a new intimacy where you come close to God and he comes close to you, and that becomes the new normal for you. Unfortunately, we don't always feel like we're close to God. Many times in our lives, particularly when we're pressed with trials and suffering, our experience testifies against God's nearness. But He's there. He's here. He's in us. And so the call is for us to believe that God is close to us. And by believing and trusting what he says in his word, that he's with us through it all, we draw near to him and we can experience his nearness in a new way and in a fresh way. And then he goes into these commands, cleanse your hands. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, these expressions of mourning and weeping are just outward expressions of repentance. you got to remember that repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin, two sides of the same turning. The language of repentance in Greek and Hebrew is the language of turning, like physically, turning. So if you think about it, if, if I turn physically at the same time in the one turn, I am turning away from you and turning toward the wall, right? So I turn one turn toward the wall and away from you. And that's the way conversion is. That's the way coming to Jesus is. You turn away from your life of sin and you turn to Jesus all in a single motion, if you will. And that's what turning to God looks like. But it has this outward expression. When you realize that you've sinned and that you've been a sinner and you know what sin is, that it's rebellion against God, 
that it is grievous to God. There's, there should be a real remorse, a real expression of grief. And so James puts it in terms that his original readers would have understood. A common way for them to, a common way for them to express their grief and their mourning and their repentance would be weeping, mourning. If these people were pleasure-driven, self-centered people at one point causing all kinds of conflicts, you can imagine them kind of laughing about their, their desires for pleasure, laughing about their conflicts with other people and their, their pursuit of more pleasure for themselves. You can imagine that. He's saying, you've got to stop all that. You've got to take your sin seriously. That's a fundamental mark of a true Christian. You care when you sin. It actually affects you. It matters. You don't want to do it. It grieves you when you do. But the final call in verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. That promise of exaltation is repeated some 14 times in Scripture, a promise of exaltation for God's people. And regularly, it's pretty clear that that promise of exaltation is a promise for judgment day. He's talking about your final experience. Humble yourself now. Humble yourself throughout your life. And the promise is on judgment day, God will exalt you. God will draw attention to you. God will provide you with all the rewards and all the pleasure you could ever want. And I think that's what James is addressing us to here. James has constantly got his attention focused on judgment day in this letter from start to finish. We'll see more about that in the next couple of weeks as well. Let's go back to this cleansing your hands language. I thought it was interesting as we've been thinking a lot about washing our hands lately. Um, we want to think a little bit about what he means here. He's commanding us, cleanse your hands, you sinners. External actions need to be cleaned up. Purify your hearts. Now, if he's addressing self-deceived people who profess to know Jesus but really don't, how can they do this? How will it be possible? And in fact, I would raise the same question about you and me. Even though we are followers of Jesus, we have the Spirit living within us, how can he just command us to purify ourselves? How can he do that? I thought about this a lot um, since we've been focusing on washing our hands so much. Um, it, it, for some people, this command troubles people. Because again, how can sinners wash their own life up? How can they clean their own sin up? How can they purify their own hearts? Uh, now think about your hand washing. You've been doing it a lot lately, I hope. When you go to wash your hands, are you actually washing your hands? Yes, of course, you turn on the faucet, you apply the soap for 20 seconds, and you put your hands under the flow of water. But what exactly cleanses your hands? What actually cleanses your hands? Isn't it the soap and water? James is using metaphorical language here, so we shouldn't press it too far, but he's calling these folks to repent and to experiencing, experience the cleansing from sin that only Jesus provides. Jesus' blood metaphorically works like soap for the soul. What does that mean? Jesus' death on the cross provides cleansing for all of our sins. We are born into this world dirty, stained by the sin of our ancestors. And then we get even dirtier by our own sin. Who could ever wash away such a stain? The scriptures repeatedly attest that only the death of Jesus in the place of sinners provides the cleansing power. We receive that cleansing by trusting in Jesus alone. James understands this, I think, and he expects his readers to understand this already. They cannot provide cleansing on their own. They must receive God's gracious cleansing through the death of Jesus and thereby turn away from their sin in faithful humility. James knows the gospel that he's preached to them, to these people, and he's assuming that they know it throughout this letter. But the key piece of all of this is the offer of this greater grace. Where is that greater grace found if not in the gospel of Jesus? Well, in verse 11, after he makes this strong call to repentance to these people, he turns to address everybody else, perhaps, and he turns back to addressing words yet again. Words against others, the law, and God, verses 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The 
one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, notice that he addresses them as brothers here. In the previous 10 verses, he called them adulteresses. He called them sinners. He called them double-minded. He called them proud, arrogant people. Here, he returns to his affectionate address as brothers. What is going on here? Well, I think he's concerned, given what he just said, about the possible response within these congregations of other people who maybe have been either not directly involved in these quarrels and fights that have been going on, or maybe they were the victim in the midst of these quarrels and fights. And so given James's condemnation of the adulteresses among them, James fears that gossip, slander, and log-eyed condemnation, log-eyed judgmentalism could result. What I mean by log-eyed judgmentalism is drawing from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5, Jesus uses an image, a very familiar and famous image, to condemn judgmentalism and hypocrisy among his followers. Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Judge not, that you be not judged. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Jesus is condemning a kind of judgmentalism. He is not forbidding pointing out sin in another believer's life. In fact, this passage instructs that we should be doing that. He is not forbidding. He is only forbidding a certain way of pointing out sin in another person's life, another believer's life. Elsewhere, in John 7, 24, he plainly commands us, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. How do we do that? Jesus offers an illustration, perhaps even a memory of something that could have taken place in his family's carpentry shop, where Jesus and James might have worked together as brothers. So imagine James and Jesus working in the carpentry shop, and one of them got a speck of sawdust in his eye. From this perhaps common scenario, Jesus suggests an illustration about sin in the lives of his followers, who are siblings together. Jesus is purposely painting a ridiculous picture to get his point across. Both brothers have a problem. One brother has a speck of sawdust in his eye, but the other brother has a log, a pillar of a building, probably more than five feet in diameter, which is wider than a man's whole head, and it's sticking out of his eye. Jesus is targeting this brother. We could call him Mr. Log in the Eye. Jesus asks Mr. Log in the eye why he sees the speck of sawdust in his brother's eye. He doesn't ask him, how can you see it? That would be a logical question. If he has a log in his own eye, that would obscure his own vision to properly see his brother's tiny speck in his eye. So how would he be able to see it? I suspect the brother with the sawdust in his eye, the brother with the speck, would have had to say something about it. He might have called out, oh no, I've got something in my eye. The speck is not supposed to represent a small, inconsequential, minor sin, while the log represents some major, heinous, or particularly evil sin. Instead, the speck represents sin that is admitted, sin that is acknowledged, sin that is confessed. Mr. Log in the Eye is in the right place to help his brother deal with his own sin, but he's not prepared. He cannot actually provide assistance because he refuses to acknowledge and deal with the log in his own eye, which is the sin that he is indulging and refusing to admit in his own life. Jesus doesn't stop with this description of the problem. Instead, he commands Mr. Log in the eye to deal with his own sin. He needs to admit his own sin in order to be prepared and able to help his brother deal with his sin. 
James may have this image in the background of his mind here. I don't know. Just after he himself has laid down some strong accusations against some folks in their churches, he recognizes that some others who have not perhaps been guilty of what James has been discussing may begin to feel rather self-righteous and begin elevating themselves to speak wickedly about these other folks, folks that James has called to repent. So instead of seeking to help these folks in their churches come to repentance, which is what they should do, some of them might be tempted to exacerbate the problem by gossiping or slandering or rising up in condemnation against the guilty. James will have none of that. As Jesus referred to Mr. Log in the Eye as a hypocrite, so James describes the situation in terms that fit as a description of hypocrisy with respect to the law. But before we look at that uh, more closely, I just I feel the need to echo the warning and the concern that Pastor Ken shared a few weeks ago in his message from the beginning of James chapter 3. James again, hones in on the danger and the harm that our words can do, particularly when we elevate ourselves in judgment against other people who claim to be Christians. And Pastor Ken wisely uh, warned us about how not only we use the words that come out of our mouths audibly and verbally, but also the words we produce with our fingers on our keyboards or our smartphones. And as many of you have noticed, I have re-entered uh, the world of social media recently. Uh, I have a strong desire to connect with more of you more regularly, and that seemed to be a good way to do it. Uh, but my re-entry into the world of social media has reminded me of why I got out in the first place. Uh, so many things that I see posted, so many things that I see reposted from other people are full of this uh, vitriol this vile uh, language and verbiage directed against other people. As Pastor Ken talked about a couple of weeks ago, people made in God's image. Now here in this passage, James is focusing his attention on the way that we speak to each other within the church. And I, I want to broaden that application just slightly and say that this warning and this danger about how we use our words to condemn other people can be just as dangerous and just as condemnable from Jesus' perspective when we direct it toward people outside the church, particularly when we direct it toward people in leadership positions in our government and the way that we criticize openly with our words on social media. We've stepped beyond a healthy dialogue about ideas and about policies into uh, attacks on people. And I've seen it uh, throughout the social media world, and I think it falls under this warning and these condemnations that James gives. And so I just want to reiterate the importance of being careful about what you post and what you type on your phone or on your computer. And you need to know that you are held accountable by God. You are held accountable by God for what you post that other people might have produced as well. Don't think that just because it didn't come out of your mouth or you didn't actually type it with your fingers, if you're sharing it with other people, repeating it for other people, you may very well be guilty of the kind of gossip and the kind of slander that this word speak evil against is describing. So let everyone examine themselves and their own usage. I'm not here to point the finger at anybody in particular, but all of us need to be very careful about the way that we use our words, not just the ones that come out of our mouth, but the, certainly the words that we produce or reproduce online. Back into James 4 here. So James's concern is that this speaking evil, this gossip or this slander or this log eyed judgmentalism might in, it will entail a hypocritical misuse of the law. While disobeying it yourself, you attempt to enforce it with others. That's part of the issue here. When he says uh, the one who speaks against a brother judges or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law, 
Becoming a judge of the law means you look at the law and you basically say, well, uh, these laws that command me not to slander or gossip or speak evil against people, they don't apply to me. But these other laws about things that these other people are doing, they apply to them. And I'm going to make sure that that's enforced, You're putting yourself in the role of the judge, which is what he'll come to in just a moment. The law, whether viewed as the Mosaic law, as interpreted by Jesus or Jesus' own teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Either way or both, the law forbids this kind of evil speech against others in the church. So those who speak evil of their siblings in this way are disobeying the law, even as they're attempting to enforce its commands against murder and coveting, for example, attempting to uphold the law as a kind of judge. The person who does this is judging the law in the sense that they are choosing which parts of the law to obey and which parts only apply to other people. Ultimately, this usurps the role of God as judge, and that is a major league no-no. You are not God. Your obligation is to love your neighbor, not judge him. Notice that he shifts at the end of this passage in verse 12 to raise the question, who are you to judge your neighbor? He's been addressing them as brothers, as siblings, but now he returns to that word neighbor. Surely he's recalling his discussion earlier about the summation of the law, the royal law, the law of the king, the law of the kingdom, that is summarized from Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says here that this kind of evil speaking against each other is breaking that law and therefore breaking the whole law. You are not fulfilling the royal law if you are not loving your neighbor as yourself. If you are rising up in judgment against your neighbor, you are not loving your neighbor. Well, as we come to conclude, I just, I think... Just can't we all just get along? Can't we all just get along? That's the question that keeps banging through my head. And the answer is no, we can't. And it's true throughout church history. I hear so many people today, teachers online and people saying that we should, we should really be working to go back to the way it was in the early church. Man, they had it all figured out. It was good. Let's, let's do things exactly the way they did them. When I read the New Testament, they have the same problems that we have today if not worse. And this particular problem of disunity and divisiveness and, and, and an inability to get along, these conflicts, they were present from the very beginning. Let me give you some examples. The book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, verses 39 and 40. Luke tells us about a conflict between the apostle Paul and his friend Barnabas. There arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. Why did they need the grace of the Lord? Because they were in conflict with each other. They needed God's grace to continue working through them as they split. This word for sharp disagreement is, is a very, very strong word. This was not, they might have come close to coming to blows, Paul and Barnabas, over this issue. That was very, very early in church history. Very early. Acts chapter 15. We're talking 10 or 15 years after Jesus had gone up to heaven. Romans 16, a decade later or so, maybe two decades uh, almost. Romans 16, at the very end of his letter to the Romans, whom he had never visited, but he knew about what was going on there. Romans 16, 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. 1 Corinthians, written in a very similar time to the church in Corinth, which we know was a mess. 1 Corinthians 1, 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. He writes another letter to the same church just a little bit later, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, at the end of 2 Corinthians, and he's saying the same thing. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, one of, the Paul, one of our favorite letters from Paul. It seems so joy-filled and so positive, and the church of Philippi seems to be a really good church. 
Uh, they've been supporting and helping Paul while he's been in prison, and he encourages them, and he reflects wonderfully. And then at the end of his letter, first at Philippians 4, 2, he names two women. For all eternity, they will be known as two women who were having trouble getting along. He names them in his letter. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And then at the end of Paul's life, he writes to Titus as Titus is attempting to uh, establish leadership in the churches that Paul had planted on the island of Crete. Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. So James is kind of issuing this kind of warning in his letter about these kinds of divisions. And Paul here is saying, warn them once, warn them even twice, extend mercy, extend grace. But then once you've warned them twice, if they keep up this divisive activity, you've got to separate from them because the danger is they can reap havoc in the church. They can destroy the testimony of the church out in the world, and they can also destroy the faith of individual Christians. This is serious stuff that we're dealing with here. The letter of Jude. Jude is James's brother. James's brother, Jude, verses 17 to 19. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. Jude says the same thing that James says. These people are acting out a demonic wisdom. There is something positive that comes out of divisions and these conflicts, God's providence. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11, a church that had so many problems, including divisiveness, including conflict, he writes in 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Paul acknowledges that God uses these conflicts. God uses these divisions to reveal who is a genuine believer in Jesus and who is not. And once we see that about ourselves or about other people, the instant reflex is not to kick them out of the church or get rid of them, but to call them to repentance the way James does. That's what we need to be doing. The remedy for the conflicts that we perpetuate and the remedy for the disordered desires inside of us is one and the same remedy. It is the greater grace of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's grace is in the gospel, saves us in the first place, saves us from our hostility against God and against each other. And then God's grace in the gospel renews our minds in such a way that our way of thinking is transformed into embodying the mindset and the lifestyle of Jesus himself. In the same letter where Paul named two women who were experiencing some kind of an interpersonal conflict and called them to agree in the Lord, he writes in Philippians 2, 2 through 11, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You have it. It belongs to you. Who, Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, a thing to be used for his own selfish advantage, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. 
This pattern of thinking can become our pattern of living. The promise of exaltation given to Jesus is a promise that is extended also to us. Jesus has already experienced his exaltation all the way to the throne at the right hand of God. If we would follow him to the promised exaltation, we must humble ourselves the way he did. We must follow the cruciform, cross-shaped life of our Savior. If we know Jesus, if we've seen him as he really is, if we understand his story, there is only one way to live. The way down is the way up. The way to receive the promised crown, the promise of reigning with Jesus, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, is by submitting our lives to him now. To, to wear the crown of suffering during this life, to share in the sufferings of the Messiah, and to willingly and continuously put the concerns of our brothers and sisters above our own. Trusting in Jesus, faith in Jesus, means trusting his work for us in the past, and it means trusting that he'll preserve us and keep us running on the track until we successfully, victoriously cross the finish line. But it also means trusting that his ways are right, that his way of living is the only way to live now and forever. Trusting him must result in obeying him. Wisdom from above results in a life of good works. Demonic wisdom results in a self-centered, self-focused life of pursuing one's own pleasure and comfort at the cost or neglect of others. Let's pursue the wisdom from above. It's found in Christ and in Christ alone. And let's abandon the demonic wisdom that is just based on human reasoning, human logic, and human sense. That way lies only madness and destruction, eternal destruction. Would you pray with me? Father, we desperately need the wisdom that you offer. Would you grant it to us in your Son by his power? We thank you for the death and resurrection and exaltation of our Savior that secures for us eternal life, a life of abundance now and forever. Thank you that you're with us. Thank you that you fill us up and you empower us with your greater grace. Thank you that you've provided a remedy that can change our self-centered, self-focused hearts and can grant the selfless wisdom that we so desperately need to live in this world well. Would you help us to love our neighbor as ourselves? Would you help us to reach out and to speak well of you and to speak well of each other as well? Would you help us by your spirit to tame these tongues and to extend that to taming our fingers as we type? Help us to be mindful of the words that we say. Help us to remember that we will give, we will give an account to you. And you do hold us accountable for words that we express, and even for the words that we think in our own hearts and in our own minds, and help us to take that really, really seriously. In Jesus' name we pray.